All right, good morning. Uh, welcome to day two of the Plato Partnership Market Innovator MI3 Academic Conference. Uh, again, my name is uh, Mike Valera. I'm the CEO of Plato Partnership. Uh, today promises to be very exciting, and we're going to start our program today with an all-star panel discussion on the European Consolidated Tape, followed by some really interesting and thought-provoking academic papers. Uh, to set the scene, back in the fourth quarter of 2021, Plato Partnership sponsored uh, an event titled The Future of the Consolidated Tape. Uh, this was well received by the marketplace. And today's panel discussion will be a continuation of the debate surrounding the creation of the consolidated tape. We will discuss where we currently stand and make suggestions on how we move forward. Uh, yesterday, I mentioned uh, the potential for Europe to set the gold standard for capital markets globally and attract global investment flows into Europe. And if you think about it, Europe has almost twice the population of North America, has similar GDP. However, America and Asia PAC have four to five times more exchange turnover than Europe. To be more competitive, Europe needs a consolidated tape both for equities and fixed income. Since the last panel discussion back in November, uh, events have moved quite rapidly. Uh, we recently had a group of powerful industry bodies, which included AFMI, the European Asset Management Association, IFAMA, and German Funds Association, the BVI, uh, which published a joint position on plans for consolidated tape in Europe. This included the desire to see a single pre-trade real-time tape provider and a rec recommendation for mandatory contributions. They also suggested that the revenue model should include all contributors and not just the incumbent exchanges, which is a topic that's extremely contentious and I'm sure the panel will, will dive into. Uh, also, as a reminder, back in November of 2021, we had the European Commission unveil uh, the Capital Markets Union package, which included the European Commission's proposal for European Consolidated Tape uh, to give investors real-time data across all trading venues in the European Union. European investors today, uh, when you think about it, have been waiting for consolidated tape for, for many, many years. Uh, we welcome that announcement uh, as an important first step. Uh, and it looks like we are closer uh, than ever to seeing a consolidated tape come to life. However, uh, you know, there's still many obstacles ahead on the political front, the commercial front, and technology fronts. So today, we will have the privilege of having an all-star panel, as I mentioned, with members who have been, uh, all have been at the forefront of the European Consolidated Tape debate. Uh, and it's a perfect uh, panel to walk us through sort of where we are and sort of where we're going. So today I have the, uh, the honor and privilege to introduce Nikki Beattie, CEO of Market Structure Partners. Uh, as our moderator today, uh, she without question is one of the most prominent voices on the European Consolidated Tape topic and one of the most uh, prominent voices on market structure in Europe uh, without question. Before I actually hand over to Nikki, uh, Anita uh, Copy from Plato is gonna come in and just uh, make a couple of points around uh, how you can actually access the Q&A uh, tab on the, uh, the platform. And with that, Anita, if I can hand over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, thank you for the introduction. So just a couple of brief points. If you're watching this on webcast on a laptop or a desktop and you want to ask a question, the button is located on the top right corner of your player. And if you're watching for a mobile device, please click the question on the top right of your screen with the three lines to, to see the ask a question button. We'll be asking the questions to the panel throughout the session. And finally, there's going to be a breakout session following the, this, um, this session, but it'll actually be after a paper, so be around 11.45. So you'd be very welcome to join that to engage directly with the, the, the esteemed panelists today. So I'm gonna hand over to Nikki Beatty now, who's going to um, take it from here. Welcome, Nikki. Thanks, Anita, and thank you, Mike, for your very generous uh, introduction. So uh, welcome everybody to the Plato discussion on the European Con Consolidated Tape. Uh, I'm going to uh, let my 
panelists who are all very well qualified uh, introduce themselves um, as we go uh, around. So they're going to introduce themselves in alphabetical order. But just before we do that, I'm just going to give you a quick synopsis of uh, where I really think we're at at this point in time with the consolidated tape. So I think, as we all know, the European Commission put out their proposed uh, package of legislative changes last November and the consolidated tape, both pre and post trade consolidated tape was at the heart of that proposal. Uh, some of the key things that they uh, introduced uh, were the idea that there should be a single CTP for each asset class. Uh, and they hope that a number of new providers would emerge rather than the incumbent data vendors. For bonds, it would be uh, post-trade only. For equities, it would be pre-trade. Um, there would be a mandatory contribution of data from trading venues and APAs, and a revenue sharing agreement should be introduced uh, to share between all the people who contribute uh, the data. Uh, and the selection criteria for the CTP would take into account uh, the idea that there should be a minimum revenue guarantee in the equity markets, i.e. there had to be some sort of guaranteed revenue back to uh, the exchanges. Uh, there was also this idea that smaller exchanges should be given preferential treatment uh, in the revenue participation scheme, uh, and that's to help keep markets viable. In response to that, what we've seen is a number of industry organisations come up with their own ideas, FISI, the ECB, we've seen a joint working group of IFARMA, AFME and SIBO, uh, and also the Dutch regulator under the AFM have uh, also created their own cross-industry working group looking more at bonds. So is there anything they agree on? Well, uh, yeah, in some cases. Uh, so they all agree that there should be a single CTP provider in each asset class. Um, but as yet, this is um, hard to know whether or not this is going to be sufficient with a private organisation fulfilling that role. They mostly agree on the fact that there should be no mandatory consumption, although some recent negotiations on whether payment fraud or flow should be banned are getting close to saying that maybe an EBBO should be established. And if it is, then payment for order flow doesn't need to be banned because there would be a clear benchmark. And that could lead us dangerously close to mandatory consumption. But I think opinions differ most on uh, post-trade and pre-trade. The Federation of European Stock Exchanges have clearly uh, marked their flag in the ground that it should be a delayed post-trade tape only. Whereas IFARMA, AFME, BVI and SIBO have all come out and said that it should be uh, pre-trade. Um, there's also been a number of comments around the fact that this does not have to be a low latency uh, tape in order for it to be useful uh, and that it should be fairly priced. Uh, the AFM themselves have done a lot more work on data standards and inputs and outputs to the tape. And so where we are right now is uh, there is a parliamentary group uh, currently preparing a report to the Econ Committee. We don't know the contents of that. And as we talk today, the Council of Ministers is meeting. So there's two work streams currently working, Council of Ministers and uh, the Parliamentary Group. And uh, their ideas will converge sometime in the autumn and there'll be a lot of negotiation around that. So that's uh, an opening statement about where we are. I will hand over to each of my panelists. I think you know who you are in alphabetical order. Please uh, briefly introduce yourselves and then we'll get into the discussion. Okay, hello everybody. I am uh, Thierry Foucault. I am professor of finance at HCC Paris. I have worked a lot on uh, the effect of market design on liquidity, price discovery, and the real economy, and in particular on the effect of market transparency on, on liquidity and, and the sale of market data by HCC. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Matthijs Genister. I'm with the uh, AFM. Pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm a senior supervisor within the uh, secondary market supervision team, and I'm currently the project lead for the consolidated tape. Good morning. Um, my name is Christoph Hock. Um, thank you for, for having me here today. Um, I have um, today two hats on. On the one hand, uh, I'm head of trading at Union Investment, um, a Germany-based um, asset manager with, uh, with, with a global approach. And uh, from, from our perspective, uh, it's, it's really key uh, to be involved um, in, uh, in, in discussions about um, finding the best regulatory environment for, for our end investors um, to be able to deliver best-in-class execution to them. And um, on the other hand, um, I'm um, co-chairman of um, Plato Partnership, um, the buy side, sell side um, collaboration, uh, to also to, uh, with, with the goal uh, to improve market structure. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Chris Murphy, uh, founder and CEO of Edify. Uh, we help capital markets clients achieve best execution. And are now uh, working with 12 large market players to bid, uh, to build and operate the bond tape. Good morning, uh, my name is Neil Ryan. I am working with Finborn Technology. Um, my role at Finborn Technology is to um, lead the CTP project and we are looking at the feasibility of being a technology provider to the consolidated tape. Good morning, I'm Leticia Visconti. I work for Barclays on the equities floor. I'm responsible for equities market structure in EMEA and connectivity to market. Uh, I'm also the representative for Barclays in a number of trade associations and at the Plateau Partnership as well. Morning, everybody. <clears throat> Susan Javari. Um, I work for Afama, which is the Pan-European Trade Association representing asset management firms. And um, I cover capital market regulation. So consolidated tape is, is very much on my radar and has been for the last year or so. Looking forward to the discussion, Nikki. Thank you. Excellent. Well, as uh, everybody heard, I think we've got a very well-qualified panel to comment on things today. So let's really get down to the thorny Thorny issues. So uh, I mentioned really we've got this uh, spectrum of ideas around uh, pre and post trade data and whether it should be real time or delayed. Um, and so let's really get to the heart of what users want and why. So Christoph, you're a buy side trader. Um, what do you want to see? Do you want this pre trade tape real time? And is it sufficient if it's not a very low latency tape? So it's we, we are clearly supporter, um, Nikki, of a um, pre-trade um, tape in equities. Um, we, we are also a big supporter for a fixed income consolidated tape. And um, for, for us, um, consolidated tape is a continuation of, of the story when, when looking at uh, regulation Europe uh, with uh, MIFID 1 and MIFID 2. Uh, we, we achieved to uh, deliver significantly higher level of transparency um, to our end investors. Um, uh, competition among um, trading platforms was, was significantly increased. And um, now with MIFID um, to uh, the, the implementation back in 2018 and, and the goal um, to create um, a CMU, um, a capital markets union here in Europe, uh, from our perspective, um, a consolidated tape is, is really an integral part of uh, this creation of, uh, of, of a CMU. Um, so, so looking uh, in, uh, in, in detail, um, data these days, um, uh, regardless whether you look from a retail investor's perspective or whether you look from a, a professional institutional investor's perspective, um, data is, is really key. And uh, in, in the US, we, we have uh, 20 years plus um, a consolidated tape. Uh, here in Europe, we, we have discussions for, for more than, than five years about the implementation. And, and now we are really pretty close uh, to, to get it done. We, we have um, full support from, from all um, industry bodies, uh, from, from all market participants. Uh, and it would be really a shame if we uh, don't um, get it done um, this time. Um, so what are um, the, the benefits uh, in, in detail? Um, a consolidated tape uh, on a second by second basis would really create um, an equal level playing field uh, among all investors groups. Um, so um, regardless whether you, you have small, medium sized, large asset managers, um, um, all of them, they, they would have accessibility um, to, to real time data. And um, on the other hand, um, um, also retail uh, is, is an important investor group these days. Um, they also could have accessibility um, to, uh, to, to real-time data. Is it in equities and, and in fixed income? So therefore, um, on a second-by-second -second basis, um, we are a big supporter of consolidated tape across asset classes. So you're saying you would definitely use, if a pre-trade second-by-second tape existed, you would be a user and you see that there would be use cases for all your buy side fellow small, particularly small and medium sized asset managers. That's what you're saying. Definitely, um, Nikki. So uh, right now, um, data, um, uh, uh, as uh, crazy as, as it sounds, um, um, market data is created by um, buy side, uh, by, by, by sell side and, and by um, a platform provider, provider as, as an intermediary right now. So raw data from, from our perspective should be 
easily accessible to to all investors and uh, at the moment um, data is uh, quite quite expensive so you definitely have some some smaller and, and medium sized asset managers uh, with not full accessibility uh, to to all data sources uh, when when it comes to trading so here we would have a creation of a um, equal level playing field and um, also when looking at larger asset managers uh, i easily can imagine that um, departments um, uh, like uh, like like risk controlling, um, like um, compliance, which um, nowadays um, uh, partially just have the the 15 minute delayed access. Uh, these uh, groups also would be uh, would be heavy user of of a fairly priced um, consolidated um, tape across asset classes. So Thanks. clear answer from my perspective. Uh, yes, uh, we we definitely would make use of it, and I believe also um, our peers. Okay, so that's hearing from Christoph, who's working at the car face. Susan, you're representing multiple buy side organizations. Uh, do all of your uh, stakeholders believe that the pre trade tape is necessary and that they would use it? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question, Nikki, and thank you for kind of going to the heart of some of the issues and the remaining stumbling blocks that we have uh, as regards this proposal. And I think if you'd asked me this question, you know, a few months back when, when the commission first came out with their proposal, I would have said that post-trade is an absolute minimum. But I think increasingly sort of given the discussions we've had and talking to market participants and sort of getting our heads around how we build this tape, I think it becomes increasingly clear that excluding pre-trade doesn't make sense. Uh, in large part, uh, with what Christoph was saying in that there's a you know, huge case, at least from a buy side perspective, there's a large use case in terms of being able to see something beyond just the executed trade data, actually seeing uh, you know, uh, market depth, understanding where the market is heading and, and being able to act on that information that, that drives trading decisions. But beyond these use cases, I think when it comes to designing the tape, uh, there's other considerations. Why do we include pre-trade? Because we want to make this tender process as efficient as possible. So if you're only asking for post-trade from day one, at some point down the line, you're going to be asking that same provider to do an infrastructure build out to say, right, can you now um, you know, support pre-trade data? Let's do that from day one. And you know, we can sort of argue over what the latency is gonna be and how much coverage we have on pre-trade, but at least we have it there, it's built in and it's ready to go. And I think the second piece, uh, in, 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 this is in the, in the document that Mike Villaro was, was referencing, <laughs> the, the, document, the principles document that we came out with a few weeks back. There's a question of viability of the tape. And again, what, what is a more uh, attractive product? One that delivers only post-trade data, data or one that has pre and post-trade? You're gonna get a much greater number of users. And as we know, one of the uh, issues we've had in the past is, you know, uh, with, with the MIFID proposal and, and, and no commercial CT providers coming forward was the viability of the tape. So I think we can address all of that with the information we have today. And I think, the pre, you know, sorry, but it does speak to pre-trade. <laughs> all roads okay. lead back to pre-trade. So you're afraid. saying... You're saying a tape would not be viable without pre-trade and that also you have this use case of uh, multiple use cases and needs for um, such a tape. Right. Um, okay, all right. And, and just to be clear, Susan, uh, you believe that, uh, I think in your report you said this as well, or in your principles that you've signed up to, that actually that a low latency tape would still be used by uh, sell-side traders, et cetera, but you believe that this second-by-second second tape that yes. uh, Christoph has just described is going to be extremely useful. Um, okay. Uh, that's right. It's complementary. It's not going to replace the low latency things. That there, there's never been a suggestion that that would happen, and we, we wouldn't expect that to happen in the marketplace. Okay. Uh, Thierry, you're an academic. You often need data in order to uh, even get your work done. Uh, and obviously the work would be more valuable the more access to data you have. Uh, what's your view about whether or not uh, pre-trade should be included in a consolidated tape? Okay, th thanks, Nikki. Uh, maybe before giving my view to that, I'm going to step back a little bit. Uh, I, I think the consolidated tape is part of a bigger issue, which is the issue of market design. And how do we want to design securities market to achieve which goal? Uh, so I think it's very important to ask the question of what is the goal we want to achieve to see whether the consolidated tape is going to help with that goal. So what is the goal? The goal is simple. Securities markets are there to help people 
to share risk and discover asset values at the lowest cost possible. That means low trading cost, high liquidity, and that means low cost of accessing information, which typically means a uh, low cost of market data, for instance. Not only that, but that's part of the cost that people pay to get their information. So the question is whether the consolidated tape is going to help us to achieve this goal. It's going to uh, help uh, the EU to achieve uh, the capital market union to achieve this goal. And, and I think the answer is yes for a simple reason, which is the equity market is very fragmented. And in a fragmented market, those who get access to information about quotes in limit order books, or those who get information, uh, access to information to uh, transaction pricing faster than the rest of the crowd, because the first people subscribe to the flat data feed, they are going to have an edge. And that means that this creates informational asymmetry between people who are slow and people who are fast, and informational asymmetries are not good for liquidity. That's a very basic message of the academic literature on market design. You want to design the market in such a way that you limit as much as possible information asymmetry. So in that sense, I think a consolidated tape is going to be very useful, both post-trade and pre-trade. And this thinking is not based just on economic reasoning, it is based on empirical facts. There have been many empirical studies on this question in the context of US equity market and US bond markets. And, and they are quite convergent. Of course, you know, they are details, and, but, but the big message is that when you make the market more transparent, for instance, when you give access to uh, our floor traders to the book of the limit of the, the New York Stock Exchange, then you typically improve you typically improve liquidity. And we saw papers yesterday that were going in that in this uh, in this direction. And the main driver, the main reason is that you reduce information asymmetry. Uh, that being said, there are many details. And of course, for instance, one reason why pre-trade might be important is that for buy for the buy side is that it's going to help the buy side to fine tune the execution algorithm. So that's one reason why I think that I, I very agree with with with, uh, with Suzanne, which is uh, if we want post trade, why not pre trade? And pre trade is going to be very useful for the buy side to fine tune uh, execution algorithm. Another reason why I think both post trade and pre trade is going to be are going to be useful, especially post trade is that it's going to help uh, the buy side to check whether they get best execution from their brokers. It's very difficult to check, to monitor uh, best execution without access to, uh, to post-trade uh, post data. Okay, thank you. Letitia, uh, you're the sell side. Your views are often discounted compared to the buy side, but I think... Uh, AFME and Pharma signed up to the same set of principles, yeah. which uh, suggested that pre-trade was very important. So who's going to use it in your organization and, and why? I think before starting to say what it's going to be used for, I think it's important to say what it is not going to be used for. Um, there is one very clear thing is it's very unlikely that the tape, if we assume that we get to a tape that has post-trade real time, and a certain level of pre-trade, it's pretty much a given that you will not be able to use this for your algorithm. You will not be able to use this for most of your traders because they have full depth market data. So some of the business case that Christophe and Susan talked about are also valid for the sales side. Uh, when you look, uh, and it's difficult, one of the issues of market data is to understand exactly how uh, the makeup of the user currently with the current economics of market data cost. But if you look inside uh, uh, each firm, uh, basically if one firm look at the way they consume market data, you will see that you have a number of users that will have Bloomberg screen, will have Reuters screen, and will be on 15 minutes delay because it's too expensive. So there is also this question of the tape by getting real-time post-trade, a decent amount of pre-trade at a minimum EBBO, maybe, along the line, expanding this pre-trade data once we find the right balance in terms of the economics of the market data uh, 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 market. Uh, we, we need to be cognizant of the fact that there is anxiety uh, from a number of markets uh, in terms of their revenue model. Uh, if you look at this, you're going to have a number of business case in risk, in market surveillance, credit risk, market risk, you start to be able to run models that are much more accurate and real time than what is being done right now. 
without increasing your cost base too much. So that's one thing. Um, on the technology point that Susan was talking about, I think it's really important wherever we land with the negotiation that the CTP is built in a way that will allow to increase the product footprint. As we get comfortable with the economics, the CTP can become more and more relevant to a number of business cases. So I would be very disappointed if we were building a tape on the basis that the CTP only receives post-trade and further down the line, you need to upgrade all the system. There are easy ways to do it. You get all the data in one go and the output of the CTP fits with what will be the legislative environment. So uh, the question of the viability of the tape is also really important. Um, as part of sell side, I've not been the one uh, the most supportive at the beginning of the CT, mainly because we were all coming from our trading desk view to say, I'm already aggregating the data. Why am I going to buy something which is aggregating it maybe in a way I don't really want to? But actually looking at all those ancillary uh, business case, you realize that there is effectively a need and there is even more of a need on, on the buy side. Uh, in terms of the viability of the tape, I was part of a group uh, who issued a press release a few, few weeks back who did a work with a consulting firm called Adamantia to look effectively at the economics of the tape. Um, so basically, it was taking back a lot of your conclusion, uh, Nikki, on the, on the market structure partners report for the European Commission, but really try to see what does it mean if we try to make it for real? So if we start to put RSP out to get uh, quotes from provider to get the lines, get the aggregation of the feed and so on. What does it mean in terms of economics? And it's not small, you know, it, it's less than what has been said by uh, other trade association. We think it's around 17 million to prop it up for the equity CT and around a 16 million run rate. So now the question is, how do you break even with this? What is the business model on the back of it? And looking at all the business case, if it's only post trade, that will be very difficult to actually get to a break even and start to redistribute revenue. That's kind of where we're coming from, from a practitioner uh, point of view. Okay. I mean, we'll come back to the costs uh, in just a second, but I think, you know, what we're, we're hearing on what's being said and I'd invite anybody else just to, to comment on this, but uh is that the trading element is a tiny, tiny part of the pyramid of use cases that exist Very within sure. all these organizations. Um, and uh, actually within that trading case, there are some people who would still use the low latency tapes, obviously for algorithmic trading, but even Christoph has just said, I think we've lost Christoph's camera, but I think he's still uh, on here. He's still saying he would use it. And I believe the sell side and the buy side would use the uh, tape as a benchmark for their discussions in trading. Um, does anybody want to comment on what I've just said about use cases or, or how that low latency tape might be used versus the, the pre-trade uh, second by second? Go on, Christoph. Um, Nikki, apologies. I have, I have some technical glitches. Can, can you repeat the question, please? Um, so I was just saying that, that what we're, we're basically saying is there's a, a, a huge number of use cases and that trading just sits at the very top of that. Uh, but even at the very top um, of those use cases, uh, we're saying, Letitia is saying that obviously the low latency tape would still be used for algorithmic trading. But you're saying um, on top of that, you would basically use, I'm asking, would you be using this tape as a, the consolidated tape as a benchmark for discussions with your uh, sell side counterparts, even though ultimately the trading would be done on a low latency tape. You're, can you just explain how you would use that tape, the consolidated tape? Yes, uh, looking uh, looking at um, a trading desk of, um, of of a large asset manager, we uh, we we actually have all the data um, uh, available which are relevant um, to deliver best in class execution to uh, to to our investors. So we we have low latency data. Uh, we, uh, 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 we we make use of when uh, when when executing um, our orders right now. Um, so therefore, um, I believe for really for a large asset manager, um, 
from large asset managers perspective we uh, we we have what 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 is required right now as mentioned beforehand um i i believe we we have several departments um uh, uh, being uh, uh, also in, involved uh, in uh, in in this uh, process uh, like uh, like like compliance uh, like like risk uh, uh, control um, um back office middle office um, uh, I'm, I'm sure um, we, we definitely would make use of a consolidated tape uh, a post trade in equities and, and also make use of the pre trade data uh, in, in these departments. And as mentioned, you, you probably have some, some smaller asset managers uh, with uh, not, not with accessibility to, to all uh, the, the humongous data to the, uh, to the data lake. Um, and, and they potentially can also make use of uh, this data um, uh, in, uh, in, in trading, actually. Okay. Uh, Thank you. All right. So various various use cases uh, from from different uh, from from different market participants. Okay, thank you, Chris. You'd like to comment? Yeah, just coming back to Thierry's point. So I, I think you know there is clearly an asymmetry of uh, information in the marketplace. Uh, I, I think you know there's a tendency here to 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 have certain um, you know certain, from certain parts of the market to say that the CT needs to be the panacea to to completely solve that asymmetry. I think you know from a technical perspective, it's always going to be difficult to get a super low latency uh, tape. But I think there is a huge um, amount of uh, of differential that we can uh, collapse here by democratizing this data. And so I think, you know, sometimes we get into uh, debates around, uh, you know, perfection. Uh, I think we should really focus on what are the uh, major things that we need to achieve from the tape in order to get 95% of the value. Uh, um, because, you know, I think uh, if I put, uh, you know, if I put myself in the, in the uh, shoes of the official authorities that are trying to push through this legislation, uh, they're hearing a, a lot of different noises from a lot of different constituents. And I think we really, as an industry, need to think about what's the most valuable. And I think that is uh, a complete uh, post-trade tape. So we get uh, even, you know, when we think about uh, fixed income, maybe after the federal periods, we get full information so that you can start to, to have a historical tape of record of transactions. And then I think, you know, on the equity tape, I think it is important to have for the, the vast majority of the market, um, a real-time but not low latency um, uh, pre-trade tape so that we can start to inform, um, you know, trading decisions. Okay. Letitia, I'll ask you to be brief with your comment because I want to move on to some yeah. other things. Go on. No, no problem. I just wanted to go back on something that Thierry said about uh, the consolidation and the fragmentation of market. Having a city that is exhaustive and cover all 27 member states is actually a formidable tool for two other things outside of our concrete user case. So one, it's an amazing tool for promoting European markets and actually sourcing foreign investment because that is, Thierry was talking about the barrier to entry of the cost of market data to even evaluate the possibility of trading in European market. The tape is the first step for this. The second one is education, you know? retail market. It's not a market I'm involved in, but it's common sense for me to think that if you have something that is easy to consume, that it can be put into apps, you're actually giving to European citizens and beyond access to everything they can trade in Europe. And that's part of the objective of the CMU. That's always the two business case people kind of fail to see because we kind of in our little European framework. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, um, I want to move on. I, Matisse, I'd, I'd ask you to, to comment on a couple of things. It would be useful to hear the regulator's view about pre and post trade tape. But I also know you've been doing uh, a lot of work in uh, the bond side of a consolidated tape. So it'd be really useful uh, first to hear your comment on pre trade data and then to hear what you've learned from your uh, bond exercise. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks. Um, so on Pre-trade data, I think I can echo some of the comments that have, that have previously been, been made. And I think a lot of it is down to supporting a, a strong use and business case for the, for the pre-trade data, which would be, in our view, solely be, be limited to the, to, to the equity tape. So um, I think if you take one step back, I think the, the whole idea behind the consolidated tape was to 
overcome the level of fragmentation within the, within the EU and support the, the idea behind um, establishing a, a capital markets union, which I think is, should be at the heart of this debate and, and making it easier for, for issuers and investors alike to get more insights on, on, on prices and, and, uh, and, and, and liquidity. So I think generally that has been very much our, our starting point. So fragmentation is not necessarily a bad thing because it has led to competition. It has led to the development of sort of various centers of expertise within the, within the EU. So, uh, but I think the missing link is, is to get this consolidated view of the, uh, uh, of, of the market across asset classes. So I think on um, um, what we have been doing as, uh, as AFM is we've been focusing much more on bonds and um, that has had a very simple reason. Um, after the, um, uh, the UK leaving the EU, we saw a, a lot of bond trading venues or non-equity asset class trading venues move to move to Amsterdam, which significantly broadened um, our supervisory uh, supervisory work. Um, we've done some research and analysis, particularly on the on the bond markets and how the whole MIFID and MIFIR framework worked out for these particular asset classes. Um, and I think the, the the overall result was that um, the, the 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 idea behind um, getting more transparency in, 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 in these market segments was, was, of course, very valid. But the, in, in, in some areas in particular, the, the, the regime around transparency was relatively ill-calibrated and, and, and needs some very targeted amendments to, uh, to make it work, um, and particularly on the whole fragmentation side and ensuring meaningful transparency and making sure that particularly the bond markets become much more attractive for, for investors and for issuers alike. Uh, the consolidated debt is, is really that, uh, that, that missing piece. Um, having said that, so um, we at the AFM have, um, have had an, an innovation hub or regulatory sandbox in place uh, for a number of years already. Um, and we um, were very happy that we welcomed uh, about six different fintechs within that uh, innovation hub that were in various stages of, the, of developing consolidated data proof of concepts. Um, we have two of them in, uh, on, on the panel here today. And what we really tried to do was get some more insights on what is possible with the consolidated data because the debate has been very fierce, especially on the equity side. I think, I think we all know that. Uh, but we wanted to get some, some real live views on what are the issues in terms of um, building a consolidated day, because I think that the debate initially was very much, well, this is not possible, the market is too fragmented, it will be from a technical operational perspective, it would be, it would be a huge challenge. I think that was the first question. And the second, the second element that was, that was cited frequently of being sort of this barrier to, to establishing the CT was, was data quality. So I think starting with the first bit on uh, on, the, on developing costs, I think we, we've seen the most outrageous numbers out there. I think even for, for, uh, for the post-trade tape, I think um, the development costs were, were, were estimated to be, to be north of 70 million euros, um, I think even higher for, for a pre-trade tape. So I think we relatively quickly established that, 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 uh, that those costs were, uh, were sort of, um, yeah, not really... Um, in line with, 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 with reality, so to say. Um, so the development costs were, um, would, be, would be manageable. Um, and I think the, the other main finding was... Um, so, so just to be absolutely clear, Matthias, you're saying you're now relieved having seen how high the costs were that some people were saying that having done your work, it's a much lower cost than you imagined and it's definitely a manageable cost. Yes, absolutely, um, and I think that the, the main the main cost, but, uh, but I think some in the panel will be will be in a, in a much better position to to, to comment on that. Uh, the, the cost will be very much around um, uh, establishing the right levels of of, of 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 connectivity. But I think with the mandatory contribution bit uh, being included in the proposal, I think that part is is relatively easy to overcome. So it's very much on the technical and operational side. But I think the main uh, the main issue at the moment is um, uh, is data quality and particularly data consistency. Um, I think we can we can think of the, the 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 best technical solutions possible, but if we don't fix this more fundamental um, element of, of of getting getting the data quality uh, getting the data quality right, I think we're we're still quite a long way from um, uh, from establishing a tape and. 
together with the industry and, and together with, uh, uh, with with the participants in the in the regulatory sandbox, we, we've done quite a lot of work to address some of those issues and and find um, find some of the find some of the main barriers and also come up with solutions on how we can tackle that. Okay, Neil, you're one of the participants in that uh, sandbox. Um, I don't know whether you'd like to comment about costs and what it takes to, to build this, and then also what are oh, sorry what are some of the other um, the other things that, uh, sorry, I'm running off my iPad, that's just fallen over. Um, the other uh, things that need to be resolved in order to build this tape. Uh, thanks, Nikki. Um, so maybe just, we are uh, involved with, with a couple of the other uh, institutions here in the, in the AFM sandbox and um, very happy to be, I have to say, Matthias. I think it's been a very useful exercise. Uh, in terms of the cost, just to be very open and direct about it, from a technology perspective, we estimate internally within Finborn the cost to be in the low millions from a tech point of view. The issue is a bit like buying an Apple phone or a computer. You, you buy the, the, the phone or the computer and then you find out that you have to the, buy the adapter and then you have to buy the, the mouse and then you have to buy all the other bits and pieces. So when we look at the construct for, construct for a CTP, we see uh, technology costs when part of it, we see operational costs when part of it, we see governance Cost been part of it, but the biggest part of it is the potential data costs, and I think the lack of clarity at the moment, as you correctly said in your in your comprehensive intro, Nikki, some of the issues have been resolved around it around the minimum payment for equities. But then, you know, based on my experience, with all due respect to any data vendors out there, they're they're pretty um, legalistic around these things, and suddenly you get into does that include historical data? Does that include redistribution? What exactly does it cost? And even if there's a revenue share to connect to all of these various different venues, and as people know, there's hundreds of venues around Europe and Letitia mentioned the, 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 the challenge that there is of 27 different countries. There, there's also, as Matthias correctly said, the challenge of connectivity to these different, everyone has a different level of technical expertise. Some of the larger exchanges, for example, are very, very technically competent. You go to smaller exchanges, they're not as competent. And it's the same with other data vendors or APAs or other um, forms of, of uh, industry providers. I, I think the other thing to think about in relation to the, the tape, and that there was a good article I saw this morning, I think in the, the trade or the other day in the trade about the COBRA project. And we chatted about this before, Nikki. This, this, this has been talked about for a very long time. There have been industry initiatives. I think the key thing is to get it right this time. As Susan said, you know, let's build a future-proofed tape. You don't have to turn everything on day one, but what you need to do is establish credibility around what's there and reinforcing the point that Matthias made. This issue of data quality, there are rules and regulations out there for a long time. The way that I view it and the way that I've described it is the rules and, and regulations and the frameworks are like a menu. The problem is everyone's picking different things in the menu and for different asset classes, and let's be honest, the equities market is a more mature market in terms of standardization. The bond markets aren't and the OTC derivative markets aren't. So, you know, it's, it's not just the cost of the tech and the data. There's all of that standardization. There's all of that connectivity that Matthias correctly said. And I fully agree, by the way, with what Chris said, which is that, you know, I think in our engagement, we have a design council with 18 different members. We've gone around to them one to one to have conversations. We found that there's probably 19 different flavors going to 18 different um, uh, market participants because everyone has their own internal competitive consolidated tape that they've built over the last number of years to compensate for the fact that there hasn't been one. So part of the challenge that there is for the CT in the wholesale market is, you know, when there's large asset managers like Union, Christoph, or, or Barclays, Letitia, um, you know, they have, they're very, very large, sophisticated operators and they just want the raw data in. They have everything built already. They have the best X. Whether that goes through, by the way, to the risk and compliance units, um, I don't think they all use the same systems and I don't think they all use the same data lake. So that is definitely a technology problem. But I also think that as you go down and maybe just to reinforce the point that, that Thierry was making uh, uh, and Matthias mentioned about the CMU, the, the second most traded security we saw in the, the reports that we've looked at are, uh, last year was GameStop. GameStop was a phenomenon 
that had nothing to do with transparency. <laughs> it's groups of people reading the internet and looking at Reddit and all sorts of things that they can trade on the exchanges and it gets recorded. And there's a millions and millions and millions of transactions, not a huge amount of, they're very small trades, but millions of transactions. So, you know, I think one of the challenges is, is that a CTP for all seasons and is it a CTP for everyone? And as Chris, just to, sorry, sabotage what you said, Chris, Everyone has their own idea of what this the CTP is. It's just making sure that the policymakers and the regulators create something that's actually viable up and down the different sectors, both wholesale and retail. Chris, do you, do you agree that this is a sort of sub 10 million built? Yeah, well, so I think, look, uh, the, the, the tech is not the issue here, right? So the tech can be done uh, from, a, from a feasibility perspective. The tech is, is fine uh, for all of the use cases that we're talking about here. Uh, clearly, when you get into super low latency, there are other issues, but uh, putting that aside, the tech is not the issue. The cost of the tech is not the issue. We ourselves have been operating we built and operated a post-trade uh, tech. We've been running it for the last four years. We just can't commercialize it. So uh, that is off the table, that's done. Where we're mainly focused uh, is around not just being the tech provider, but thinking about all of the operational and governance aspects of a fully operating CTP, right? So that, that, that uh, revolves around governance. Uh, you know, our uh, bid will be uh, based around a utility model, so independent governance and, and operated explicitly on a not-for-profit basis. We think that, uh, you know, in terms of uh, what really dominates the commercials here, it's around things like, um, you know, the, the, the revenue rebate back to the data providers, what that looks like uh, uh, when it comes out of the, um, uh, all of the discussions. Uh, but even um, if uh, the, 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 the data comes for free, um, you know, there are things around redistribution rights, audit rights of the, uh, of the uh, data providers. As soon as you get into those complex web of, uh, of uh, audit rights, it means that the cost of running it goes up, the cost of consuming it goes up because there are all of those hidden costs that you need to prepare for. And then also, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about data quality and it's, uh, it's data quality uh, coming down the pipe from the data providers, but it's also reference data quality. Uh, and that really, uh, again, is a major impediment to, to the, the success of the tape because if, uh, you know, the, the consolidation of this data is only as good as the input data. And so unless we, we, we have a mechanism whereby we can clean up this, uh, this, this data over time, uh, then uh, you know, the commercial viability of the tape is gonna be undermined because people are not going to want to pay for it. So I think all of those uh, issues dominate whether the tech is feasible or not. The tech is feasible at a low cost. Uh, you know, we are talking about, uh, you know, to, 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 to Neil's point, uh, low millions of dollars. It's not, it's not tens of millions of dollars. Um, it's all of the other issues that we really need to start to focus on. So we seem to have a lot of convergence around costs. I mean, I think our own report said it would be about 11 million to set up and seven to nine to, to run. Uh, Letitia, you just mentioned the Adamantia report, uh, which has come out with slightly higher figures, but in the ballpark, they're not that much different. And you guys looking at running a post-trade uh, bond tape at the moment are coming out with low 10. So we seem to be getting a lot of consensus around cost, which is a good thing. Um, can I just ask you, Chris and Neil, I mean, you know, can you do all of this as technology providers? Can you do all of the data licensing, all the commercial contracts? Can you manage all of that? Are you set up to, to be that sort of organization? Uh, yeah, so from our perspective, we are planning to do all of that, whether it's uh, uh, us um, alone or with other partners as well. So all of the data licensing and, and all of that stuff, yeah. So that, okay. that needs to be, you know, for, for a successful bid uh, into any tender process, you need to, to um, have a solution for all of those things. Neil, any yeah. comment? I don't know. In, in our case, we're, we're maybe taking, might be the same approach, Chris. I'm not sure we're going to work with a partner who's a specialist in this. And, and that's the approach that we're going to take because our specialization is the tech. And if I may just mention one thing as well, just picking up on a point that Chris met, mentioned, there's a lot of emphasis on the governance of this thing. Don't forget, it's going to be a regulated entity. So, I mean, ultimately, our view is that data standards and the overall governance will be reportable through to ESMA anyway. So um, 
you know, the work that we've been doing with, with one of the representative bodies more recently on, on, I think it was in relation to corporate bonds, you know, we were using that as a sort of example of how we thought a consolidated tape provider could actually provide information for other, you know, policymakers to decide what to do and provide uh, intact reports. But the, the emphasis that there has been on governance, we don't think, for example, that the consolidated tape should be in charge of data standards. They should inform the relevant industry parties and the relevant regulators around what they are, but they shouldn't be the arbiter of it, I don't think. So Matthias, how, how is that going to be managed? Is it your view that, that ESMA or, or the regulators are going to manage that? Or do we need some sort of further organisational layer sitting over all of this? Well, the, the, the idea is, of course, that, that, that ESMA is, is currently now the supervisor for, for the RSPs. And I think that the, the general idea is that um, they will also become the, uh, the supervisor for the consolidated tape providers. But I think just coming back to, you, to, your, uh, to, your, to your question, um, I think there's a clear separation of different functions that, that we'd like to see in, in a consolidated tape provider. So there's the tech on the one hand, but there's also the admin on the, on the other side. And the admin will be around subscription management, um, data licensing, billing, and those kind of things. And um, they should all be tendered, um, so sort of also be assessed in the tender process in the same way as I think we would look at, at, at the tech, whether the provider has the capability to, to do that, whether um, um, that is outsourced or whether that is that is done, done internally. I think that, that that's less relevant, but I think all these different criteria um, should be part of the uh, of the tender and, uh, uh, and, and award process. Okay, uh, we got 10 minutes to go. I'm running on the assumption the last thing I saw, there were no questions, but if anybody's got an urgent question, please make sure you get it through. Although at this point, I'd say, you know, we've got the breakout group, which would be a better po point probably to have uh, long discursive uh, answers to questions. So I'm going to carry on on a couple of other thorny uh, issues. Um, Minimum revenue guarantees. Thierry, what's your view as to whether exchanges uh, should be getting some sort of minimum revenue guarantee for uh, submitting their data? Well, I, I think it's an important issue. I think they should get some guarantees. They should be rewarded for, uh, for the data they provide. But there, there, are, there are at least three issues that I would raise on that. Which is, The first one is... Um, what's going to be the sharing of the revenue of the... What's going to be the rule for sharing the revenues of the consolidated tech among the contributors. And it's not completely obvious. I mean, do you want to have a sharing based on trading volume? Do you want to have a sharing based on the contribution to price discovery? That's not the same thing. The primary market contributes a lot to price discovery, for instance, but may have a larger, a smaller share of uh, trading volume. Those are very difficult issues, but very important if you want to, to have this type of agreement. The second one is that I think there is a lack of information on the cost of producing and disseminating the data by exchanges. For one report I wrote recently for the CPR, I tried to get information on that because that's the only way to decide whether the price of data is too large compared to the cost. In order to, to say something on that, you need to observe the price, you need to observe the cost. So getting information on the cost is very difficult. Uh, there is an interesting report uh, written by IEX, which is a US exchange, uh, that shows that, according to their calculation, the cost is low, but they have a vested interest because they do not sell uh, any data. But that's the only, the only report I know on this question. So I think to decide about you know, the type, the amount of revenue the exchanges should get from the, from the consolidated data, this is an important piece of information. And the last thing I would like to mention uh, is a word of caution, which is about the business model of exchanges. That's something that Leticia mentioned uh, previously, which is, Exchanges are like a multi-product firm. They are selling data, they are selling trading services, they are, they are selling listing services. The, the price they charge for trading services has become very small. Trading fees are very small. They are sometimes even negative for some participants. And my guess is that the reason for that is because they want to subsidize trading to generate data because the, 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 the product that generates revenue is the data, very much like in other industries. That means that if we constrain exchanges on their ability to generate revenue from data, it's likely that trading fees may increase. Or you have to cut you know, the, the cost subsidization. I'm not sure this is going on. That's just a conjecture. I don't know any academic paper that shows that something like that is going on. But I think it's a reasonable conjecture. That's something that people should keep in mind uh, when we talk about the, the, trying to lower the cost of uh, getting access to the data. 
Well, I, I would counter that. I mean, the interesting thing is that some of the exchanges that try and get themselves off the ground, like IEX, uh, don't charge anything for their data because they can't get paid for their data. And yet they've got some of the lowest uh, trading fees. I'm not saying IEX has got the lowest trading fees, but certainly some of the competing European venues have got some of the lowest trading fees. So uh, I think there would be a, an interesting academic study to be done um, on that. Um, Susan, this minimum revenue guarantee is also associated with this idea that smaller markets need to be uh, rewarded to remain viable. So some of the more uh, developing markets in the EU are, are concerned about losing um, data revenue if there's a consolidated tape. What's your view on that? So I think I, I fully concur with what uh, Thierry said in terms of the correct pricing for the tape and that there should be some uh, reward and compensation back to the contributing venues. We should include all of them, not just the uh, incumbent exchanges. Equally, it should be fairly priced in that users should want to pay for this data service. So, so I think what we're trying to avoid, and this wasn't really apparent in the original commission proposal, is avoid a situation where we have uncapped revenues going back to um, the exchanges. We don't want sort of year-on-year sort of astronomical growth, that that's not where we want to end up. As far as the smaller markets, Nikki, I think there's definitely a case to have a carve out, um, you know, so preferential treatment. And I think uh, the carve out would look something like, and, and as Thierry said, you know, there's, there's still, um, you know, some discussions to be had around how we define the smaller market, you know, less liquid stocks and, and how we reward that, but certainly the data that a smaller market contributes should have, you know, should receive more in dollar terms than, than the equivalent data contribution from a large exchange. I think that there's a strong case for that. Uh, there's a second piece to this uh, that we go into in our principles document, which is um, allowing the smaller markets also to retain the ability to redistribute and license that data. So you can't license off uh, the CT, you allow the um, the smaller markets to, to negotiate those contracts themselves. And I think finally, going back to uh, what Leticia said uh, so eloquently is, we often miss the point of why we're trying to have this, why we're all in this room together speaking, you know, it's not sort of moving the, the pillars back and forth. We're trying to achieve a consolidated tape because we genuinely believe that there is value in this product, particularly for smaller markets, and I think that, you know, if we can manage sort of the, the, uh, the some, some of the pain that will be felt, some of the revenue dislocation, that may happen. We recognize that. We manage that in the, in the short term. In the medium to long term, I think we, 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 we definitely do see um, benefits there. And I think, again, uh, repeating what Leticia has already said, there's a visibility question that's just not there today. Today, you have to opt in to buy data from the Zagreb exchange or the Prague exchange. Tomorrow, a global investor or a European investor will be able to see that data, read it off, see the liquidity that's available and be able to act on that. And I think that can only be a positive thing and, and sort of lead to greater uh, listing activity and, you know, stronger capital markets in those areas. So I, I'll stop there. But just um, uh, just on coming back on that point. So I think it's, it's clear to, to many of us that one of the major sticking points in Brussels at the moment with regards to the debate around consolidated tape is uh, um, the smaller exchanges. So, you know, would, would this panel think that there would be value to leaving those uh, to one side and just focusing on the major market centers? Uh, as a uh, as a first version of the tape, and then you know having those come in uh, as a phase two, um, because it's my understanding that a lot of the debate right now is around those those smaller venues. So, Letitia, do you want to comment on that? Um, I think it will be a miss if we were doing this. So, to Susan's point, there is a potential disruption to manage for the smaller exchanges. But the city is one is for me the city is an enabler, so it's one way of potentially growing the pie, you know, growing how much we can attract to Europe. Um, I'm found a non-negligible part of my my time talking to foreign investors to get them to trade with us in Europe. It always goes the same way. They will always try start with London, Paris, Germany. And some of them will actually back off from European market because of the cost of market data. If you have something that is affordable 
not uh, uh, suitable for trading, huh, for algorithmic trading. You give a better insight of what can be achieved in Europe and you actually maximize your chance to attract foreign investment. The question of how you, and, and Thierry alluded to that, the business model of the exchange, that was my first reaction to say, but an exchange shouldn't have revenue out of market data, should get revenue out of transactions. But actually, you need the market data to pump up the transaction. So I appreciate there is this disruption to manage, and we need to find a way of safeguarding and walking the small exchange through this transformation so they're getting more revenue in the end in terms of transactional transaction rather than market data. But okay, the market that operates on the back of market data revenue is not Matthias, the point, right? I'm going to let you comment, and then I see Christoph. We need to be quick because we're coming to the end of the session. Yeah, uh, so, so I think very quickly. So, so I'm I'm convinced that that smaller exchanges in particular will be will be benefiting most from a consolidated data simply by getting so much more visibility on their uh, on, on their markets and making them more attractive to um, to raise capital. Because I think at the end of the day, that's 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 one of their uh, what, that's one of their core functions. Um, I think if if this is what it takes to bring the debate forward at, at this stage and sort of get to a, a, a staggered approach to consolidated data implementation. It's, it's not a very clean or elegant solution, but I think if this is what it takes to bring the debate forward, then uh, we would be supportive of that. I mean, you know, I think there would be tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of users that would automatically get the smaller market data, the market's data that they don't get today. So for me, I think they'd be far better off with their data in. Christoph, a final quick comment. Yeah, I think, uh, again, so I absolutely echo what Leticia mentioned. It's important to look from a helicopter perspective. It's, it's about capital markets union. So, so it's not about the nitty gritty discussion. Do we take uh, some, some revenue uh, away from, from exchanges? Mike mentioned in his introduction that over the last 10, 15 years, um, uh, traded volumes in Europe, they went sideways, uh, where, whereas in the US and Asia, uh, we, we've had a kind of hockey stick uh, increase of, of volume. Looking at IPOs, uh, in, in the US, you, you have tons of IPOs. Uh, here in Europe, we, we are struggling uh, to, to bring European uh, companies um, to, to capital markets. So uh, a consolidated tape is a key element of, of capital markets union. And capital markets union will help increasing equity volumes. Uh, capital markets union will help bringing more companies uh, to, to refinance themselves um, via, um, via exchanges. And this will definitely be supportive uh, for, for primary exchanges. Is it the large ones or is it the smaller ones when having significantly increasing equity volumes going forward? And I think that's um, the, the, the big picture we, we have to take into account. Uh, consolidated tape is a strategic element which is required to, to have a successful capital markets union and all participants, including exchanges, and they, they definitely will benefit from this. Okay, thank you, Christoph. So just to sum up and finish off, I mean, I think we've actually had quite a bit of consensus on here, just in terms of pre-trade is, is really important for the use cases. It's also critical for uh, the viability of the tape. Uh, the, the, the costs of building this are not that great. It's definitely not a technology issue. Uh, actually, the costs are coming out to be quite low. So the things to be resolved are more around the cost of the data and how that sort of interaction is going to be working. Uh, and then the fact that people don't think data should be free. It should be. The, the venues that contribute should be paid for it. Uh, and everybody is willing to provide more back to the smaller exchanges and think they might be better off as a result of uh, a consolidated tape. So I'd encourage anybody who's got questions, come to the breakout session, which is in 45 minutes. And thank you very much.